Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian from the Royal International Air Tattoo at RAF Fairford in the United Kingdom. And we're honored to have with us as our guest, Lieutenant General John Dog Davis, who is the Deputy Commandant for Av Aviation for the United States Marine Corps. Sir, congratulations. Great to see you, Vago. It's not, not congrats to me, but it's a congrats to uh, General Neller and the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy and the U.S. Air Force that got these jets over here. And, it's a great day for all of our countries and uh, really proud of the Marines, soldiers and airmen uh, that helped uh, put this together. It, it, is a, it is a great day. Everybody's been working on it for uh, 20 years. You know, I actually covered when it became JAST, the Joint Advanced Strike Technology, and now there's an, there's an actual airplane that's uh, being delivered. Um, your uh, charge, however, is to get this aircraft into full operational service as quickly as possible. You're looking at the next challenges from the Marine Corps standpoint. What are the next challenges you're trying to tackle in this? I'd say the next opportunities. The big one for us looming in our bow is to get the VMFA-121, our first operational squadron, and move that to Japan, to a permanent change of station. To Iwakuni. Iwaku Marine Corps Air Station, Iwakuni, Japan. Um, end up with 16 airplanes. Uh, we start in January with 10. We move another six out there in June, July. We'll have 16 airplanes out there by July of 2017. So that's an opportunity for us to get the airplane out to the Pacific. Um, looking forward to that. I guess the bigger bigger thing for us is that we're now approaching full rate production for F-35. And uh, what we see out of this airplane operationally is, is all goodness. And uh, getting this airplane in the hands of our Marines, getting it to support the Marines in the ground, our combatant commanders and fleet commanders from sea bases and shore bases is absolutely key. So my job is to, to get the, make sure the full rate production happens, that we get the airplanes uh, produced and the squadrons fielded and, uh, and ready to deploy uh, and support our, our Marines uh, around the world. So a big challenge is make sure that happens, make sure now we get the airplanes, the tr that the training is right, and that our uh, sustainment model is, uh, is right for the number of airplanes we're, we're delivering as well. One of the things you said when you testified to Congress last month was that uh, you, know, you used the Jurassic Park uh, analogy, the airplane is a lot like the Velociraptor and that it kills everything that it comes into, into contact with. Talk to us a little bit about some specific cases on how the aircraft is demonstrating capabilities that are superior to the legacy force. Yeah, so I maybe got myself in a little bit of trouble. I, I had watched Jurassic Park the night before and I had watched the Velociraptors go through this. It was actually the aftermath of the Velociraptors going through the valley and it was just, you know, a lot of, a lot of dead dinosaurs out there. There, there, were, there were some carnage. Yeah, carnage. So the, the F-35 is a very effective, very, very, very effective uh, killing machine. Um, and uh, we're at the, point the, at the point of the spear, and uh, we have to give the very best tool to our Marines to go do that job. And so um, what we're seeing in the F-35 is a qualitative uh, difference from anything we've ever flown before. And it's not just the airplane, but it's the airplanes and how the Marines are flying the airplane and using the information that the airplane uh, gives to the pilots and how they combine in, in, uh, in a group of aviators airborne to, uh, to make great decisions out there and to employ effectively as a team and frankly teaming with the guys on the ground. What we're seeing right now is a qualitative difference from anything we've seen before. A lot of the scenarios our guys are going with uh, four airplanes would, would have taken me 13 or 14 airplanes to do before and they're doing it very, very effectively uh, with, a, with a smaller number of airplanes. I think it's going to increase our combat capability, increase our ability to do our job. Uh, the Marine Corps is the folks that have to be the most ready when the nation is least ready, and uh, that's against any threat, any foe, any place, any time. So from a sea base, from a shore base, an expeditionary base, uh, we can provide uh, air support to our Marines regardless of the threat, regardless of the weather, regardless of the time of day. We are very, very excited to get this capability in the hands of our Marines. What are um, some of the statistics? Because obviously it's the Joint Strike yeah. Fighter. It's, it's seen as a strike aircraft, yeah. uh, but it's also been engaging air-to-air -air and doing some yeah. very, very strong air-to-air -air work. Walk us through some of the statistics you've been seeing in some of these exercises, including uh, the recent exercise yeah, where... WTI. Yeah, so uh, during the, uh, the operational race inspection, we ran an air-to-air -air scenario. Uh, we wanted to test that. We ran for every mission set that the airplane is, was supposed to be able to do in its IOC configuration. Um, Again, early model airplane, early software. Uh, the air-to-air -air scenario was, you know, it was a 4v9, and it was nine dead bandits and zero dead F-35s. So very, very positive. Uh, Again, it's a very, a very significant threat out there. They did a really great job. Um, the last WTI exercise, we ran a kind of a force on force. Which are twice a year. That twice happened. a year we do that, much like the Air Force Fighter Weapons School. Um, 
they went up there. Uh, we had a scenario. It's a, it was a strike scenario against the integrated air defense and uh, fighters, and uh, they turned in a very, very solid performance. Um, uh, all the strikers got through. That was also we had some. We brought some fourth generation airplanes in the target area, but uh, it was a, basically a 24 to zero kill ratio. So none of the none of the friendlies got killed, but 24 of the bad guys and the and the were were no longer simulated uh, flying anymore. So. Uh, Great effort, great effort out there, great capability from the part of the Marines that are flying the airplane. It's, it's, a, it's a force multiplier in many ways, so um, that's why we're excited about this capability. The Marines, um, more than the other services, by the acknowledgement of the other services, have been doing what's seen as some of the deeper intellectual thinking about how to employ the, the, the aircraft. It's not the other services aren't, but the Marine Corps has been among the most enthusiastic supporters of the aircraft. In fact, you could argue that it was the Brits and the, and the Marines that kept the program uh, alive through some very dark days. What are some of the completely novel ways of uh, concepts of operations that you guys are working on developing that will see this aircraft be critical, whether it's in a small scale engagement, whether it's from a bear base engagement, or whether it's part of a, of a far, far larger, multi hundreds, thousand aircraft uh, combat operation? Well, first, I wouldn't be so pompous to say that we're out in front of everybody. I, but we are very good, I mean, we look at what everybody else is doing there, sir. Uh, we learn from the Air Force, we learn from the Navy, we learn from the, the British, we learn from everybody that's operating and thinking about this airplane. But we have, this is, this was our airplane. We're going to skinny down to one time model series uh, jet in the United States Marine Corps, that's the F-35. 353 F-35Bs, fit, uh, 67 uh, C models. Um, so we've been thinking about this and at the, the, at the forefront, the vanguard of this for a long time, not only from a, from a programmatic sense, but a, uh, as an intellectual sense as well. So uh, I would say that, you know, you look at uh, the challenges the, the, our nation faces, the free world faces, uh, with an anti-access, you know, area denial uh, threat out there, you want to be able to be, distribute your forces, okay? You want to be able to use every, every system, every platform you can to basically project power from. That's nothing new for the Marine Corps. We've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, and so, you know, operating from an amphibious carrier where I can have eight airplanes or I could have 16 airplanes. Uh, operating from expeditionary ships ashore, where I could go, uh, with, you know, basically we operate out of a forward air refueling point, like we did in Afghanistan with our Harriers, like we train to right now with our F-35s. So we we take a jet off, we do a close air support mission, we drop down. We had a, a C-130 or a V-22 fly in a load of ordnance and gas. We land the jets. We never shut them down. We reload them with ordnance. We reload them with fuel and expendables, and we take off again. And for the Battle of Marja, we were on deck for you know 15 minutes, and basically we doubled and tripled our sortie rate with the same number of airplanes. So that's I would say that might be innovative. We just were kind of creatures of necessity. So whatever it takes to get air power over top of the Marines is what our the corner of the realm for the United States Marines are, and that's the Marines flying the F-35. So what we've got is a very very high end fifth generation airplane can operate from a small deck can operate from a ship like the Queen Elizabeth, we hope, someday, uh, and also operate from next year ships ashore and provide high sortie rates. Uh, we think that's exceptional and that's what we're pretty excited about. And the other thing, most important, is the threat changes and evolves. We never want a condition out there anywhere, anytime that the weather or the threat would, uh, would uh, deny close air support to a Marine on the ground. So this airplane, all weather, can see through the clouds very, very well and also can, can deny uh, virtually every threat out there. We're very excited to, to get uh, air support to our Marines from this airplane. You're a Harrier pilot. You have the distinction of being the last American A model uh, guy trained. You saw the Harrier through all of its iterations and are now guiding the JSF into service. The Harrier had a reputation for being highly sophisticated, but simple and robust and able to do bear base operations, which is what you did in your early, for many years in the early part of your career. There are those who say that the F-35 is simply too, too advanced, too complex to do those kind of bear base operations. What's your view and what's the Marine Corps doing to be able to operate this aircraft the way the Harrier was intended and designed to be operated? I, I, I'd say that that's baloney. It's, uh, it is, the Harrier is a complex airplane, complicated, but we, we employed it from, uh, from expeditionary bases and, and amphibious ships for, for a long, long time and was very, very successful at it. Um, we'll do the same thing with this airplane. We're doing it right now. We've taken the airplane at 20 Amp Palm, shown that we can operate in an austere environment. We've gone to, to do our, uh, our operational test at sea. Um, we've gone to uh, Red Flag and done very, very well. We've gone through the WTI class where we practice expeditionary FARP operations with this airplane. Uh, the airplane is proving to be 
robust, um, very, very capable in the air, and uh, the Marines love it. So uh, I, I think, you know, uh, if anything, I want to make sure I've got the right part support for the airplane, that we've got all the parts we need to make sure we got maximum radius out of the platforms. Um, no problems on that? I, w I would say we're, we, we're recovering from not buying enough spare parts for the airplane uh, in the first part of the last couple of years. Congress has been very good to us. Uh, last year added a lot of money for spare parts for F-35, pretty much exactly what we asked for, and that's going to help a lot. So it helps with our, when this airplane hits the fleet, okay, and it's, it's coming, right? So we're moving to Japan. Everybody's going to want that airplane overhead or on a ship. Uh, or on a, on a FARP, so I've got, you know, my, I'm I think I'm racing against the clock to get spare parts out there so we can actually fly a lot right. and uh, provide the kind of capabilities we need for the people who are going to demand this capability the second it gets out to the fleet. Um, a quick, I know that this is uh, gets into something yeah. very sensitive, but from a radar cross-section standpoint, you know, the Harrier didn't matter how dirty it got, just like a naval air aircraft yeah. or anything. It, are you guys thinking about how you operate this aircraft where it is going to be dirty but RCS is... Here's what I'd say is, Say it's not necessarily true. We cared how dirty it got because dirt adds to signature. You've got IR signature, you've got radar signature. And it um, the drag. And it we, we, we assess our radar signature all the time, right? We're not finding uh, problems not operating out of the field of this airplane. So we'll learn more and more about the airplane as we do that, but right now we're not seeing problems with signature. The Air Force is going through um, a very big close air support debate. Yeah. Um, the Air Force decided to sunset the A-10, to retire the A-10, uh, and that precipitated a battle with Congress, and now the Air Force is looking at a new close air support aircraft. What can the Air Force learn from how the Marine Corps is approaching this challenge, uh, you know, with, for example, the F-35B, in how there may be different ways of, of achieving that CAST mission? The Marine Corps always put a priority on close air support. So, yeah, the, we want to, you know, we've got a, a small diameter bomb we're going to put on the airplane, which is a, one of our priorities, why I can carry internally, even in a, in a uh, high threat uh, scenario where it requires radar cross section, I can carry eight internal uh, SDB-2s. That's a great capability. Small diameter bomb. Small diameter bomb, yeah. So we're pressing for that. The way we train, our IOC had a lot of close air support uh, tests to make sure we could do the job out there. Um, but I'd say is, uh, and each service has a different rule and mission. I'm operating from a sea base or expeditionary base to the shore. Um, I, you know, talk, people talk about a high-low mix of capability. Well, I'm buying 383 uh, Cobras and, and Venoms, uh, Venoms and uh, H1 Zulus and Yankees out there, which are great close air support airplanes for the for the what you know some might say is the low mix. I bring in the F-35. I've got my high-low mix, I can, and those airplanes can go anywhere and do anything. We'll network our, our Cobras and our, uh, our, Yan our Yankees with like Link 16 so they can be part of the, the targeting grid. We'll give them like an A9X for my Cobras so they can go out there and help out in the, the higher end fight. So bottom line is I think we're bringing the right kind of capabilities in the Marine Corps for close air support. We'll always put a premium on that. And again, the reason we're buying an F-35B is so I can put, it's not just the weapons, but it's putting an airplane close overhead the Marine on the ground. Now, regardless of the threat, regardless of the weather, I've got an airplane I can put in close proximity to my grunts. So in that cycle time we talked about, match that with a culture of the Marines flying it, we're in, we're in high cotton. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about air, airborne electronic attack briefly. Yeah. Um, that's very, very important to you. Obviously, the Prowler is being, uh, being retired. The Marines have been doing Intrepid Tiger 1, yeah. Intrepid Tiger 2. Yeah. Talk to us about the airborne electronic attack capability you want to bring, because there are a lot of people who say, oh, it's a stealth jet and it doesn't need airborne electronic that's, attack. I don't want to go into all the capabilities of the airplane, but it's got a very uh, high-end electronic warfare organic capability, uh, which we intend to leverage every bit of it. It's very, very impressive what we're seeing in the airplane, how we operate right now. So that's goodness. Um, so I'll have 420 strike fighters that also have electronic warfare capability. That's good. Um, I'm going to combine that with putting a, something like an Intrepid Tiger or Intrepid Tiger on every one of my other platforms out there, V-22s, C-130s. It's already flying on the Yankee. We're going to put it on the Cobra as well. We're also going to we missionize the payload so we can put it inside our MQ-21 uh, black, uh, Blackjack uh, UAVs. So everything that flies in the Marine Corps will be an electronic warfare contributor and network uh, via the link. That's, that's a real capability, and that's something I don't have right now. So it'll be different. The Prowler's been an incredible airplane. In the Marine Corps, in fact, was at the, the vanguard of developing the Prowler and bringing that into service with our fleet. And its process, right? The A6A was- It was, also, absolutely, yeah. And even going further back than that. Yeah, well, we, we've been strong proponents of electronic warfare. 
And, and now we've actually, I'd say we finally got our stuff together. Now we're going to have electronic warfare not just be a high demand and low density uh, capability, but in every part of the Marine Corps as well. Two very, very quick questions, and I know because I know you have to run. Uh, the first question is a readiness question. Yeah. Um, you, you've already said that the Marine Corps is down to, only has about 55% of the up aircraft that it needs in order to be able right. to do, or you're down 55% yeah. against the up aircraft you need. Right. Obviously, uh, the budgetary challenges contributed to that. Walk us through how you're going to be rebuilding that readiness. Now, part of that's the, the Marine Corps right now is, the Marine Corps has been fighting actively for, for 15 years at a minimum. Uh, and the aviation component of the Marine Corps has been forward deployed and really busy. Right now we are, the TAC air side of it, which you're kind of looking at here, is a deployment to dwell of one to two. Steady state operations is deployed to dwell of one to three. So we're using our assets at a very high rate um, the demand for what we provide is, uh, is very high. So that's led to some of the readiness challenges we've had, also some of the fiscal uh, stuff. Also too, our, our TAC air platforms are aging. Uh, F-18, our F-18s are 20 plus years old on average. Uh, the, and, the, the Harrier, and the Harrier is 19 years old on average. And those are remanufactured Harriers from uh, day attack AV-8Bs. So our fleet is old, uh, tried and true, doing well, but uh, not uh, re delivering the readiness, certainly on the F-18 that we expect and need. Um, so job one for us is to get into the new metal as quickly as we can, and that's this F-35B that's out in the, uh, doing so well out here in the, the air display at uh, Fairford. Um, and then really attacking uh, systemically the sustainment model that we have and ensuring that we have the spare parts. I think spare parts is a key part of our readiness challenge right now. Um, so focus on the spare parts, focus on training our maintainers, the, the high standard, giving them the tools and the training they need to be uh, the, the best maintainers they can be. And frankly, the material we have to deal with right now is the very best Marines we've ever had in active duty. They're, we're very busy and we've been running pretty hard for 15 years, so uh, making sure that we got the parts and the training we need for our Marines, I think is, is key, and putting them in the new metal as quickly as we can as well. And in 15 seconds, uh, 53 kilo, very, very important program for the Marine Corps. Yeah. It's had the rollout. Yeah. What's next for that program? Uh, we're, we're steady as she goes right there. The airplane just lifted a 27,000 pound external lift. Never in the history of aviation has a helicopter lifted that much. So, and we, and from the strain gauges that we test as a fully instrument airplane, that airplane's got a lot more to give. Um, so we're really excited about what the K is delivering for us in test. Um, we're going to continue to basically keep that airplane in test, develop it, get the hours on it, get the test points we need on it, and then basically declare uh, and get it into full rate production, declare initial operating capability in 2019 and get that out to the fleet. Sir, thanks very much for joining Honor. us. Thanks, Vago. Thanks.